Yeah, I'm going to talk about the CRISPR technology, a technology that changes the world. So it's in the, on the same level as the PCR or as uh, 3D printing, something like that. So it has the potential to change really the world. So it's about uh, genetic modification. So the classical way of genetic modification is just the classic breeding, um, ionization, radiation, chemistry, so the classic breeding, you have the mother and the father and it follows the Mendel rules. Um, ionization, radiation and chemistry introduces base pairing and uh, later at the level of replication uh, mutations are introduced because the DNA polymerase cannot work with uh, dimeric uh, nucleotides. And then the last point, since the last 20, 30, 40 years, we have the classic uh, genetic engineering. So the classic genetic engineering is the introduction of um, so-called gene cassettes. So for the gene cassettes, you need uh, promotory. So you need the regulatory sequences. You need a promoter for binding of the RNA polymerase. Then you have the gene, or it's called the event. And um, at the end of the event, you have a terminator sequence. And you put the whole cassette into the cell, and then um, yeah, you hope uh, what happened where the introduction occurs. So it's a random integration, but it's an intentional event. Um, since, uh, let's say, uh, less than uh, 10 years, we have a forward system. It's called the genome editing or the, the uh, gene share in German. So this is uh, a very new system where you don't need uh, gene cassettes. So you can introduce a mutation or a new genetic information without the use of uh, regulatory sequences. So you don't need a cassette consisting of a promoter sequence of the event and also of the terminator sequence. So you can introduce just a single base or you can introduce just a, a part of a gene or you can inactivate a gene. So this is a targeted event. And I will talk in the next uh, few minutes about the technology. So there are some issues in making of uh, genetically modified organisms. And it doesn't matter if you work on microorganisms or, or if you work on prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Um, the first point is to, you have to bring the new information into the cell. So there are a few standard technologies. So starting with uh, transformation, or if you work with uh, eukaryotic cells, you are, or you are talking of uh, transfection. Um, so the, if you work with uh, plant cells, you use for the transfection um, a bacterium. Uh, it's called the Agrobacterium uh, tumefaciens, and uh, this bacterium, uh, um, this <coughs> bacterium, can be loaded with a plasmid. It's called a TE plasmid, the tumor-inducing plasmid. And on this plasmid is the genetic information. Another technique is the particle gun. So you have high-density metal particles which are coated with DNA. And then you put it into the cells. So you have to use high-density particles. So with aluminum or with a plastic particle, it won't work. So if you use gold or tungsten, you have a density of approximately around 20 gram per, um, cub for, per uh, cubic uh, meter, uh, centi uh, per, yeah, per centimeter hoch drei. <laughs> so and um, another point, another technique is the electroporation. And um, the fourth is the protoplast transformation. So you. You, uh, for the protoplast uh, transformation, um, you work on cells which um, are uh, separated by pectinases, and then the cell walls are um, um, dissolved uh, by cellulase, and you work just with the, with the uh, cells without the, the cell membranes. 
So these are the first points you have to, to have to follow. You have to bring the DNA into the cell. And then, this is very important, um, then you remember the three classical techniques, so working with uh, classical breeding and working with ionization or chemistry or with uh, the classical genetic modification. This is just randomly. So you have no targeted, no directed um, um, putting the DNA at a specific place. But with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and also with uh, some um, similar technologies, you can direct your event at a specific place on the genome. So in general, the challenge is to find a position. If you work on a human genome, it has a length of around 3.23 billion nucleotides. So you have to address one point on this uh, genome. So if you um, just um, take it as a distance in millimeters, so each nucleotide one millimeter, then it's a distance of 3,230 kilometers. And you have to know personally each millimeter. So this is um, the recommendation. Um, uh, this, um, so, so exactly uh, your technique um, has to work if you work on um, human uh, genome. So the genome, if you want to do some manipulation, uh, some genetic manipulation, you have to cut the genome at the right place. This is the um, prerequisite. Then, if you have cut the genome at this place, you can edit the genome. So you can copy, paste, or delete um, some information. So for the identification of the intended positions, um, you have at least three techniques available. So you have three specific interactions you can use. The first is the DNA-DNA interaction. The second is the protein-DNA interaction. And the third is the RNA-DNA interaction. So the DNA is always the position on the genome. And um, the first part is uh, what you use to recognize the right position. So let's start with the DNA DNA. So this technique is called the oligonucleotide directed mutagenesis. So you need, uh, you use um, oligonucleotide. It has a length of around 50 to 200 bases. So it's a single oligonucleotide, uh, it's a single chain oligonucleotide. And then you have, this is the same as I said before, you have to bring this information into the cell. And then um, this is not known very well. It's, uh, maybe it's um, a triple helix uh, formed by, the, by your, um, uh, using your oligonucleotide and also the, the genomic sequence. So um, the first part is recognition um, and repair of the mis mismatch by cellular repair mechanism. So, Therefore, the oligonucleotide, which have the new information, uh, serves as a template. And then, after a while, the oligonucleotide is degraded by cellular processes. And this is one of the main problems, because the, a single-chain uh, single uh, oligonucleotide is not very stable in the cell. So it can be attacked by nucleases, and uh, therefore, um, people work on the stabilization of those sequences. So let's say you know it, maybe if you work with uh, RNAs, you know it from the capping. You can stabilize RNA uh, using caps at the 5 prime or at the 3 prime end. So this technique has already, already been applied uh, to canola, mice, wheat, and so on and so forth. So the, the next technique I want to show you is a protein DNA interaction. So it's a more or less programmable technology. Uh, this is also called the site-directed nucleases. 
So in general, um, people um, use um, zinc fingers. Zinc fingers can recognize um, um, free, free base uh, part of the DNA, free bases. And if you combine, so this is a, a site-specific recognition. So if you combine different zinc fingers, you can write down a sequence. So you get the, um, the um, specificity by combining different zinc fingers. And then the very important step is to cut uh, the genome at your specific site. Then um, first is the combination of the different zinc fingers to get the specificity and then to combine the combination of the different zinc fingers with an endonuclease domain. So you have the direction uh, by the zinc fingers and then the cutting by the um, nuclease. In most cases, they use uh, the FOC1 um, nuclease. It's a type 2 S restriction enzyme. Another technique is um, the tail end systems. Um, it works similar to that. Uh, they also use um, protein domains which are able to recognize uh, DNA sequences. Um, both techniques are, are pretty good, but it's um, very uh, time consuming to develop those binding domains because it's just a try and an error. And also, um, it's, it's a, a lot of protein evolution work. But this was the, um, the successor of um, the new uh, CRISPR technology. And last but not least, the RNA DNA uh, recognition. So it's the, the CRISPR Cas9 system, it's the programmable site directed nuclease technology. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And CAS9 stands for CRISPR associated nuclease number nine. So the CRISPR is uh, a part, I will come to this uh, in a few minutes, and the CAS9 is just a nuclease. It's a programmable nuclease. So it's, it's comparable to an endonuclease you use for molecular biology, but those endonucleases are not programmable. So, if you use a ECOR1 enzyme, for example, you need the recognition site of GAATTC, and this is fixed. So if you use the CAS9, the recognition site is not fixed, so you can program it by combination of this enzyme with an RNA sequence. So let's go to the CRISPR story. So um, I have... Uh, I show you the, the three most important, or the three earliest publications. So it starts in 1995, so it's a pretty young uh, technology. And then, uh, the, so the first publications in 1995 and around 2000 by Mochika, they uh, recognized on the genome of different organisms uh, they started with uh, bacteria, um, some short tandem repeat sequences. So tandem repeat means that the repeats are defined and uh, between the repeats there is something which I didn't know. So and this was in 1995 and around 2000. And in 2002, and this was the, the most important publication in this story, it was by Janssen et al. And um, he defined the term CRISPR. So CRISPR clustered regulatory interspaced short palindromic uh, repeats. And um, near to this CRISPR um, region, a group of gene was discovered. Um, and they called the group of gene the CRISPR associated genes, so the, the CAS genes. And they are just numbered because at, this, uh, at that time, they didn't know what, um, for what uh, those sequences stands for. And uh, on this picture, you see, you see the, um, the CRISPR locus. 
And um, so what you see here, you have the cast uh, cascade, so the cast gene, and before the cast gene you have the tracer RNA. I come back to the tracer RNA sequence later. And then you have um, spacer and repeats. So the repeats are fixed, they are organism specific, and the spacer are more or less uh, variable. But at this time, people didn't know for what the spacer stands. And then the next step, so in the years 2005 to 2007, uh, people recognized that the spacer sequences are identical to foreign DNA from bacteriophages. So parts from bacteriophages, so these are um, bacterial viruses which are going to attack the bacterial cell and the bacteria takes parts of the virus uh, genome and put it into their own genome. And this was uh, very important because um, then um, a new virus attack is going on. The bacteria knows that this is a enemy sequence and is able to attack the virus. So it was called it's similar to, a, to an immune system, so it was called the bacterial immune system. It has nothing to do with antibodies, but it's, it's um, a defense uh, mechanism against um, viruses. So, and uh, how does it work in uh, detail? We don't have to go uh, through it in, uh, in detail. So this is the, the virus sequence. And uh, this is the part of the sequence which is recognized by the bacterium. Directly at the uh, three prime end of this sequence part, there is a PAM. It's called the PAM sequence. So it's um, three bases in case of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And this is called the protospacer adjacent motif, the PAM sequence. And this is very important because the bacteria only takes sequences from the virus in the case that the PAM sequence is directly at the free prime end. Otherwise, if this would not be the case, the Cas9 enzyme, which is expressed by the bacteria, would attack their own genome. And this is a, a protection of self-digestion. So in any case, uh, this combination has to be there. Otherwise, the sequence is not useful for the CRISPR-Cas9 system of the bacteria. And the PAM sequence is specific for the organism. So E. coli has his own PAM sequence, Bacillus subtilis, and so on and so forth. So, and then... This part is introduced as a spacer in the CRISPR locus. And then the whole thing is um, expressed, starting with the tracer RNA and also with the Cas9 locus and also with the spacer. So and what we get here, we get um, a transcript of the tracer RNA part and also a transcript of the, of the CRISPR uh, part of the spacer, and you see here we have the red one is the sequence of the of the virus. We have the black one. This is the repeat, and the black one is uh, complementary to this black one of the tracer RNA. The next step is that the tracer RNA binds to this primary transcript, forms a complex, um, and then. The last step is that this complex binds to the Cas9. So this cloud you see here in brown is just a nuclease. And the nuclease is activated by binding this complex. So the complex of tracer RNA and the so-called CRRNA. And then the um, whole um, nuclease is activated and if a foreign DNA is coming with the same sequence, it is attacked by the nuclease. So, so 
So what uh, do we need uh, for this system? We need uh, the CRRNA. It um, has the, the information which we want to attack. Um, and um, this CR, this, um, this CRRNA is complementary to the target sequence. And the target sequence is um, arbitrarily changeable. So this is the part which you can program. And then uh, the sequence contains a CR uh, repeat. So and the repeat binds to the tracer RNA, and the tracer RNA is uh, responsible uh, for the activation of the uh, Cas9 nuclease. So and then the year 2012 came uh, with uh, Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what they did, they combined the tracer RNA and the CR RNA. So they just, so this is the original system where you have the um, hybridization of the CR RNA and the tracer RNA. And what they did, they just introduced a linker loop. So you now have, for the technical application, you just have one RNA sequence. And it, this makes the system much easier to handle. So if you, in any case, if you have to work with uh, two different RNA sequences, um, you have to uh, protect both sequences. It's, 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 it's a lot of work. And this was very smart to combine, to combine uh, these two sequences. And uh, this was the publication in Science. And I think this was the, the most important part for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry which uh, they get in uh, 2020. So the system offers um, outstanding uh, advantages. So the Cas9 system um, is not only active in prokaryotes, you can use it in any organism, so you can use it in eukaryotes, you can also use it in humans. You have some problems if you use it in humans. Um, which are not all solved yet. You can use it in animals, you can use it in plants. And it is no longer necessary to add uh, gene markers, so you don't need to use resistant genes, which you use normally um, when you're doing uh, classical genetic modification. And if you don't have to use resistant markers, you don't have to remove it afterwards. And the consequence and also the disadvantage is the monitoring. So you can't see what you did. So if you don't introduce the regulatory sequences, which are normally used for PCR for monitoring, so normally if you check um, for genetic modification, you start with a screening primer. The screening primer binds on the regulatory sequences. But if you don't have the regulatory sequences, you can have um, the screening um, primer. So PCR screening is no more uh, possible. So, um, yeah, to, if the system should work, you have, uh, we, we, we just cut, we open the genomes, but we have to close the genomes again. So closure of the cutting site by, this occurs by natural uh, repair processes. So there are two systems. Uh, one system is the non-homologous uh, end joining pathway. Um, so normally if you cut um, double-stranded sequence, you get overhangs, you get sticky ends or you get plants. And the normal case is that you get sticky ends and the sticky, the sticky ends are filled and then the smooth ends are um, joined together. What you get here is an inactivation of the gene because you, get, you introduce a frame shift. So this technique can be used for gene silencing. So if you want to destroy an information on the genome, you just carry out the non-homologous um, end joining pathway. Another point, and this is also very important, is the homology-directed repair pathway. And with this repair pathway, 
you can introduce new information. You don't have to introduce whole genes. You can also introduce just part of genes or just one mutation. Um, if you want to introduce just one mutation, which makes sense, so if you want to get a change in your amino acid sequence, you use the homology directed repair pathway. So this can be really used for genome editing. Um, yeah, success control. This is also very important. Um, you have two uh, parts you want to control. The one part is, did you introduce your information at the right place? So did your system do what you wanted to do? And the second point, are other areas affected by your manipulation? And this is um, also very important because if other uh, sites are affected, we are uh, talking of off-target mutations. So off-target means beside your site you wanted to change, you get something. Um, so what you can do here, for example, whole genome sequences, you can uh, detect um, single nucleotide polymorphism, you can detect indels, uh, structural variants, it's very expensive because you have to do deep sequencing, because you have to be very, very sure um, in terms you work with humans. In case of plants, um, yeah, it's also important, but it's not so important. And what you need is um, a reference sequence. You need the reference genome information. This has to be also very, very reliable. Yeah, um, detectability, um, this is a very important point. As you know, in Germany, at the moment, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, is seen as genetic modification. If you go to US, it's not genetic modification because they follow another philosophy. They are saying, OK, if uh, you introduce a single mutation, the single mutation can also be introduced on a natural way. So it can come from uh, natural occurring chemicals or from uh, sun radiation or something like that. So you are not able to distinguish between a natural occurring mutation and um, genetically directed, um, so an anthropogenic, let's say anthropogenic um, mutation. And this is very, um, uh, very important because in, in Europe um, people say, okay, this is just a genetic um, modification and um, the outcome has to be handled as a genetically modified organism. There are some uh, possible ways out. I just have only one minute uh, remaining. Um, so I, w I would like to skip this uh, point. So the off-target mutation is very important. As I said already, um, if people work on uh, gene therapy on humans, so they have to make sure that um, the off-target activity is minimized. And um, yeah. So this is uh, Jennifer Dudna. Uh, I take this photo in Chicago a few years ago, where they, where she gave, uh, she gave a, a talk about the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and there are lots of uh, fields of applications on the new breeding technologies, and I just want to show you some examples. So in 2015, uh, mushrooms has been engineered using the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology. So um, these mush mushrooms, um, and these mushrooms, the uh, uh, polyphenol oxidase have been slowed down. So the enzyme activity was reduced approximately to 30 percent, um, leading to a tanning resistance. So this has, um, this is not because this was uh, done in U.S. It's not a genetically modified organism. 
So another um, example, so bacteria are used um, in this case, um, acetogenic bacteria um, have the potential to convert um, single carbon gases uh, into a range of uh, bulk chemicals and um, bacterium have been uh, changed uh, to do this job in a very proper way. Also, aquaculture uh, breeding is a very important field. And you just see here a, a list of um, different uh, species which have been uh, attacked with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And uh, what you see here, you always have uh, one or more than one genes which are attacked by the technology. And then you have the rate of interest. So pigmentation is one of the interests and immunity, um, growth is very important, disease resistance is very important. So um, the aquaculture breeding is a um, very um, important topic in uh, US. So and this is another example, calf without horns. Um, so Besides these um, in vivo fields of applications, uh, we in my lab are working on ex vivo fields of applications. So the, the Cas9, as I said before, is just a nuclease. It's a programmable nuclease. And in some cases, if you want to uh, detect um, a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, you do it using a restriction enzyme. But uh, if you want to use a restriction enzyme, you need the recognition site. Uh, but in many cases, you don't have this uh, recognition site available. So in those cases, we are using the Cas9 and also other nucleases, uh, which we are programming to our sequence just as a normal nuclear nuclease. And this works very well. And you see here we have uh, a recent publication in uh, food control, for example. And this is a new system. This is just in press in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry. Uh, here we use the CPF1. This is a new uh, discovered uh, nucleus in this CRISPR field. It's also called the CRISPR, the, the Cas12A. And um, the difference between the the Cas9 and the Cas12R is just a PAM sequence. So you have the PAM sequence with three bases. So here you are limited on GC-rich sequences. If you use this programmable nuclease Cas9, you are limited on GC-rich sequences. Uh, if you use the Cas12R, you are not limited because you can use also a T-rich sequence. This is very important because we are working on uh, the detection of biological identities. And for this, for this work, we use plastid sequences. And plastid sequences of plants are always uh, AT rich. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks to my group and also thanks to uh, my collaborators. And last but not least, thanks to you for your attention. And I just used four minutes too much. Okay, thank you.